them some slides if they want them. But actually, I think after today's conversation, I think it'd be better for me to give you a, a, a short story without a selection of slides, and I'll keep it short. So I come from a long history of playing in the token and ICO tech. Um, can you hear me now? So for those of you who may know, is that my, let me use this one. Okay. So some of you may know, um, in my ancient history, I had a very good friend of mine um, named Joe Trippi. He doesn't know I'm throwing his name out on stage. Um, Joe's, on my, Joe's on my board of directors. And, and Joe and I met back in 1996. And the reason we met back in 1996 is he owned some of the shares in stock, and I'd just been handed by my dad a public company that had run out of all its money and run out of its products. Had no products, no sales, no infrastructure. Um, had $3 million in bottomless convertible debt, and they were going to close it down. Instead, they handed me the reins. And, and he called me up, and he's like, I own some of your stock. This is really cool what you're doing. You know, it's unfortunate you've got delisted and you're on the pink sheets, but what we need is more volume. And so we ex we, we, he says, I can help you. So I'm like, great. So Joe came up, and we put together a social media outreach program to the stock chat boards. And we became the most ever socially active NASDAQ traded, publicly traded company in the world for, I don't know, what, 20 years, 15 years at the time. And, and had a truly fantastic community of those who supported that. And in that process, we took an equity from a dollar delisted on NASDAQ to bounced it off 50 in March of 2000. We were all really smart in March of 2000. The dot-com thing was fantastic. Um, and, and then went on from there to, to spend a decade um, sort of slaving through the mud of, of putting technology out in the market and having what truly was an incredible social community following what we did. And so in a year and a half ago at Consensus, when somebody suggested I should do a token sale, it was an interesting opportunity to look around, and I was like, oh my god, these are my people. The only thing that's really interesting is that, as opposed to them being mostly North American, <laughs> like, you got all these guys in China who are on the chat board talking to you at Chinese at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's fantastic. And, and so we have an incredible responsibility to help people who have understood what we're trying to do and how we're trying to create value with the pre-selling of product and the making available of that product and changing the consumer protections that have existed in the software industry. Because in the software industry, if you bought too many copies of Microsoft Office, guess what happens? You're screwed. You can't turn them in. You can't take them back. You can't return them. You, like, playing your company and you get 50,000 employees, you buy 50,000 seats in Microsoft Office and then you fire 10,000 employees, you have 10,000 extra seats in Microsoft Office. What do you do with them? Nothing. You burn them. And that's how they've maintained their value proposition in the market. There's no secondary market for Microsoft Office licenses. So when you read my token sale agreement for the software license, which is access to cyber services on a device, the only real difference between it and a standard enterprise software license is one line. And that one line is you have the right to resell it. You can resell it on Craigslist. You can resell it on eBay. You can go to Bittrex and resell it there. We don't really care where you resell it. There's a secondary opportunity to move that product and to continue it on, and that software and value might deliver value on a long-term basis. So we know something. We know that the world of microtransactions and services is coming, that the subscriber-based web is going to happen. How's that look? Anybody like printed out? My favorite conversation at home right now is between my wife and my 23-year-old daughter about the visa bill. She's like, all right, there's $75 worth of crap on the visa bill every single month. Can you explain to me what, blah, there's some like, obscurely coded thing from like Washington State that is some cloud service that she's signed up to. She doesn't even know what it is. Well, you need to get these off my bill. The only way to get them off the bill is to call up Visa and report your card stolen. 
That actually works quite well. But that's kind of an annoying process for everybody involved. So you can sort of start again from ground, signing up to services you don't know you have. And so this model for how we're going to transact business across the internet, the use of utility, is really important. We've talked a lot over the course of the last 24 hours or 48 hours about utility and security. And, and so I'm a card-carrying utility token. We sell software licenses. And we think the interesting question is for you to understand how do those software licenses get used and why the hell would we ever do this with a token? And the reason that we do this with a token is because we've discovered a new secret. And the new secret is we can monetize a network effect. In the past, we just collected revenue. The network effect had no value. It might have driven your market cap up because maybe it was going to, in the future, drive more revenue. But this monetization of the network effect will always forerun the revenue generated by the network effect. And so this is a new opportunity to create digital assets that will help fund, execute, and deliver these ideas. So I'll finish with one thought. How does a token work? And I think everybody should ask every project and be able to understand how does your token work? In our case, it's super simple. We think a device needs an allowance, money that's automatic on your device. So we think an average device should have five or $10 worth of value in the device, stored in the device. Why? Because when it spends, spends a penny, it shouldn't have to ask you for permission to spend the penny, because that would get super annoying to have your robot asking you at 3 o'clock in the morning, Susan, can I spend a penny? like wake you up to push the button, right? That's not what we want. We want robots to have automatic money. So cool, that's an easy concept, $10 a device. So if we ship a million devices, you'd need a store of value of $10 million to satisfy a million devices. It's not a complicated equation. So you can look at our tokens in circulation today. They're like 26 million, so it makes for easy math. Call it 25 million at 10 cents. It's not quite that, but it's close. So, so therefore, to get to $10 million, you'd need 40 cents in value in the token. Or you couldn't fund the $10 million in store of value. What's interesting in this space is how many tokens are in a sock drawer. Because the problem is, you don't really have 26 million tokens in circulation. Somebody's deciding, Michael's not giving us his tokens to fund the devices. He's got them in his sock drawer, protected by AT&T. And, and, and so in that context, you know, you get to 90% of the tokens held, now you need a $4 token. And so what I find fascinating in this space is as we build business, our token just goes up and down with Ethereum like this. The question is, like if you announced a telco, which we did a few months ago, is gonna put our stuff in partnership with them into 360 million devices, well, that's one of the variables in my token value equation. Ah, that made tokens go down. That's really a disconnect. It's a fascinating question as to how that process carries on. So you need services that drive consumption, which drive how much allowance you want. The more services, the more allowance you're gonna to wanna to put on your device. The more devices, the more it goes up. So I just think as you look at all of our projects, we're not just random digital assets. These are all independent things that will move in independent ways. And it's important to understand what are the things that move these infrastructures, and is the company executing in its ability to move those? And so I'll stop there.